143. Post-Christian Era. Calcedon Report No. 87. November 1st, 1972. An idea very heavily promoted by humanists in recent years, and, unfortunately, picked up by all too many Christians, is that we are moving into a post-Christian era. According to this belief, the Christian centuries have come to an end, and we are now moving into a new age. Some call it the era of scientific humanism, others of scientific socialism, and still others call it the age of Aquarius. For the occultists, as of old, this is the Third Age or Third World Era. The occultist Foster Bailey in The Spirit of Masonry, 1957, wrote that The Jewish dispensation came to an end and the Christian dispensation began with the passing of our son into the sign Pisces, the fishes. Today we are passing rapidly into another sign, the sign of Aquarius. The theologians who get their doctrine from the popular press and the streets have echoed this humanistic chorus. And they tell us we are in a post-Christian era. Is this true? With the waning of the, quote, middle end quote ages, Europe moved into an anti-Christian era, which culminated in the Renaissance. The church was largely captured by cynical humanists who treated it as a price to be exploited. The Reformation and the Counter-Reformation were reactions against this, and they strove to recapture church, state, school and society for Christian faith. In varying degrees this was done. Humanism, however, was revived in the Enlightenment. It began its conquest of Christendom. It embarked on a deliberate and determined anti-Christian and post-Christian era. Historians have long masked and underplayed the militant anti-Christianity of the Enlightenment thinkers and their successors. It is to the credit of Peter Gay's work, The Enlightenment, two volumes, that he develops this aspect of their thoughts. It was clearly central. With the 18th century, Europe moved steadily into a post-Christian era. Every area of life was steadily divorced from Christianity and reinterpreted in humanistic terms. True, there were Christian counter-movements against the humanistic culture, but because these were largely pietistic, they did not challenge humanism as such. In fact, because pietism came to emphasize soul-saving above all else, it became thereby humanistic also. It put man at the centre of its gospel, whereas Christ said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, emphasis added. The Shorter Catechism had taught, Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now humanism and religion had come to agree that the glory of man is the end and purpose of all things. The 18th and 19th centuries were humanistic and anti-Christian in their basic motives, and yet they were very largely influenced by still powerful Christian standards also. In the sciences and in various other areas of study, not only did Christian scholars predominate, but the idea of an ultimate and God-created order still governed men's minds. In philosophy, God had been abandoned in everyday life as well as the sciences. He was still the ultimate power, although receding in centrality. With Darwin and Freud, humanism abandoned the God concept and, at the same time, committed suicide. For Darwin, not God, but chance is essentially ultimate, although traces of providence still are strong in his system. The basic emphasis, however, was away from God's design to chance variations and natural selection. Instead of an ultimate mind, man lived against the background of an ultimate meaninglessness, and man was depreciated. If all the area surrounding a man's house is suddenly turned into a dump, then that man's house is not only depreciated, but possibly rendered untenable as rodents take over the area. Similarly, humanism, as it dispensed with God, dispensed also with the meaning 
purpose and dignity of life. Freud furthered this process, knowing full well what he was doing to humanism thereby. However, holding to an evolutionary position, he reduced mind to a frail latecomer whose every working was an outcropping of primitive motives from the unconscious. Philosophy could not very well survive under this premise. Darwin himself wrote in 1881 that With me the horrid doubt always rises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? Francis Darwin, editor, The Life and Letters of Charles Darwin, Volume 2, New York, New York, Basic Books, 1959, page 285. The effect of this collapse of humanism was apparent in every area of life. Prideau has observed of Delacroix, he was the last painter in whom the humanist Renaissance conception as a totality manifested itself with poetic fervour. Jean Prideau, The World of Delacroix, 1798-1863, New York, New York, Silver Burnett Press, 1966, page 12. Since Delacroix, humanists have presented us with a limited world, then a fragmented world, and now an exploded and dying world. Suicidism has possessed the humanists. Fiedler has cited this weariness with life which marks humanistic writers. There is a weariness in the West which undercuts the struggle between socialism and capitalism, democracy and autocracy, a weariness with humanism itself which underlies all the movements of our world, a weariness with the striving to be men. It is the end of man which the school of Burroughs foretells, not in terms of doom, but of triumph. The writer William Burroughs, to whom Fiedler refers, gives us a vision of the end of man, total death. Leslie Fiedler, Waiting for the End, New York, New York, Stein and Day, 1964, page 168. Fiedler is right. Modern humanistic man is waiting for the end. The end of every age is marked by certain recurring interests. As meaning from God is abandoned, meaning is sought by man from below, in occultism, Satanism, magic and witchcraft. Rome in its decline was marked by such interests. As Christendom collapsed after the 13th century, these same movements revived and with intensity possessed the minds of despairing men. The same interests are again with us. Not as signs of the birth of the age of Aquarius, but as evidences of the dying agony of humanism. Are we facing a post-Christian era? The men who so declare are as blind as that false messiah, Woodrow Wilson, who believed that he had a better way than Christ, who held that a war could be fought to end all wars and to make the world safe for democracy, and who felt that paper documents could harness and control the evil goals of men and nations. Wilson's great crusade did not usher in a new world order of peace and prosperity, rather it inaugurated the Armageddon of humanism. Franklin Delano Roosevelt embarked on a similar crusade in Europe, and the breakdown of humanism was only hastened. It is not a post-Christian era that we face, but a post-humanistic world. Every thinker who evades that fact is past-oriented and blind. He is incapable of preparing anyone for the realities of our present situation. Humanism on all sides is busy committing Harry Curie. It is disemboweling itself with passion and fervour. It needs no enemies, because humanism is now its own worst enemy. We have lived thus far in a post-Christian era, and it is dying. The important question is, what shall we do? We must recognise that this is one of the greatest, if not the greatest opportunity yet to come to Christianity. This is a time of glorious opportunity, a turning point in history 
the wise will prepare for it. True, the Church is remarkably incompetent and sterile in the face of this crisis. It has very largely joined the enemy. This, however, has happened before. In the 4th century, the Church repeatedly condemned St. Athanasius, as the state listed him as a wanted outlaw. He was accused by churchmen of trying to stop the food supply to the capital. He was accused of murder, but the dead man was proven to be alive. He was charged with magic and sorcery and much else, and his life was lived in flight with five periods of exile. All the same, it was Athanasius, and not his enemies, nor the powerful churchmen of his day, who shaped the future. History, then as now, is not shaped by majorities, but by men who provide the faith and the ideas for living. Smith has said of modern man, How may we describe the present situation? Man is his own master, and thus aware that there are no bounds to his powers. He can do anything that he wishes to do. He's free and come of age. But he is also the slave of ideologies. He recognises that his existence as a man carries with it the demand to be himself as a single personal being, in Kierkegaard's phrase, and at the same time he finds himself continually threatened with immersion in the life of the collective, and he even desires this in order that he may evade the hard demand to be a single person. Ronald Gregor Smith, post-Renaissance man, in William Nichols, editor, Conflicting Images of Man, New York, New York, Seabury Press, 1966, page 32. This is an interesting indication of the paralysis and helplessness of humanistic man. Men who are at war with themselves and resentful of life and its requirements are not able to command the future. They cannot even command themselves. Every day our problem is less and less humanism and more and more ourselves. Is our life and action productive of a new social order? Are we governed by principles and ideas which will help determine the new direction of history? Is our thinking still directed by sterile statism? And do we believe that the answer to man's problems is to capture the machinery of the state? Or do we recognise that we must, first of all, be commanded by God before we can effectively command ourselves and our futures? Leslie Fielder aptly titled his study of the modern mood as reflected in literature, Waiting for the End. We can add that it also involves waiting for a ready-made answer. The temper of our radicals is a demand for total solutions now. Quite aptly, they call themselves the now generation. Quite logically, magic and witchcraft are very closely tied to the now generation. Magic and witchcraft offer a mythical alternative to patient work and reconstruction. A few words and formulae, and presto, the desired thing supposedly appears. In the politics of magic, a few catchphrases are endlessly repeated, some laws passed or some revolutionary action paraded, and presto, paradise should suddenly come. But for the nasty work of the vile reactionaries, Push the right revolutionary button, such is the faith of the now generation, and the dream world will emerge. No sweat, only revolutionary heroics in terms of the lit, lit movies our radicals and their babysitters grew up with. This generation would do well to remember the words of Christ concerning the kingdom of God, words too rarely if ever preached on. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Mark chapter 4 verse 28 There is a spontaneity of growth which is not dependent upon man. The earth brings forth growth. But man must sow the seed, till the field, and work to bring forth the harvest. There must be, first, Faith that results will come, and second, work to plant and till for that harvest. 
Men doubt today that God brings forth his purposed results, and they refuse to work for any goals. We live in an age when men want to harvest corn before they have planted it. We live, briefly, in a political or statist era, a day when men believe in the ability of the state and its politicians to solve problems by means of their legislative hocus-pocus, when the desperate need instead is for faith and work. The important question for a, quote, now generation, end quote, becomes the search for a politician with the right hocus-pocus. But, first the blade, and the blade cannot appear without a planting. This is the time to create new and free schools, Christian hospitals, independent professional societies, biblically principled and new enterprises of every kind. The time is now. I recall the words of a supposedly intelligent man, speaking in 1939, holding that it was too late. No doubt these words are as old as man, and still a mark of defeatism and stupidity, still a mark of waiting for ready-made, push-button answers. I recall vividly as a schoolboy being told of automatic thermostat-controlled heating systems, then a new thing, as the forerunner, it was held, of a push-button automatic world, in which all answers came freely. Nothing was said about the work that went into producing the thermostat, nor the new industries it furthered, nor the new kinds of work it made possible. It was seen only as a step forwards towards the dream of instant paradise in a ready-made world. I did not know it then, but those teachers were preparing the way for the return of a faith in magic and witchcraft. But, our Lord said, First, the blade. Done any planting lately? Or are you waiting for someone with the right hocus-pocus? If so, you will die with this dying, non-Christian era. Don't count on us sending flowers.